Good morning, good afternoon, good evening ladies and gents around the world and welcome back to A History of Humanity as part of the Grand Portfolio. And today, the moment you've all been waiting for. One of my favourite parts of history, one of my favourite civilizations, and certainly one I've been waiting to do on this channel for a good long while. Because unlike all the other early civilizations we've covered across the world, this time, we've got evidence, we've got writing, we've got a full pantheon, we've got structures, monuments, tombs, we've got records of ways of life, records of religion, medicine, art, innovation, culture, literature, myth, Egypt has it all, and I am not even kidding. Ah, <sighs> this is gonna be long, but this time round, it's gonna be easy. Ish. No, I said easy-ish. So today, we're going to start with the Old Kingdom, and then later move on to the first intermediary period of ancient Egypt's history. So, first of all, funny thing to know with the modern name we have for the country isn't, in fact, its original name. No, the name of Egypt we have today is actually derived from the Greek word Egyptos, who in Greek mythology was a king of the region and grandson of the sea god Poseidon. However, to the ancient Egyptians themselves, their country was known as Kemet, which in their language means black land, and was named this in recognition of the black silt that the River Nile would bring to the region every time it flooded, which was rich with nutrients and minerals, enough for the Egyptians to farm a bounty of agricultural goods and various crops, which as we'll later discover, turned them into an ancient superpower. And for reference, you may want to keep any thoughts about the Nile close at hand, because as we'll see as we go down the line, the River Nile itself was fundamental to ancient Egyptian society. So much so, that theories, thoughts and discussions surrounding the Nile and its various flooding and receding points throughout the year are crucial to every sector of ancient Egyptian society. From agriculture to medicine to mythology, the Nile meant absolutely everything to the ancient Egyptians. But before we go as nuts about the Nile as the ancient Egyptians were, let's discuss the origin story of ancient Egypt. So, from evidence, we have found that the Nile River Valley itself was first inhabited around 6000 BC, so we're talking about 8000 years ago now. Mysteriously though, the rock carvings and paintings found in the area, most notably at Sabu Jadi in northern Sudan, depicts the area as having been abundant in wildlife such as hippos, giraffes, lions and crocodiles, which could indicate that Egypt and Sudan as we know them today weren't always the desert landscapes that we are so familiar with. And speaking of climate, that brings us on to agriculture. It's thought that the first evidence of organised farming in the Egyptian area begins around 5000 BC roughly 7,000 years ago. The inscriptions at Sabu Jadi also depict peoples using the stereotypical style of boat that we associate with ancient Egypt travelling up and down the Nile, which indicates that there may have been some form of basic government controlling all of this network of agriculture up and down the Nile. But any instance of large government is not noted to have appeared until at least circa 3150 BC, with the beginning of the early dynastic period of Egypt. However, don't get confused, because this period of Egyptian history actually predates that of the Old Kingdom. So with this, our story begins with an individual known as King Menes, or King Nama as he is sometimes known who was said to have united the upper and lower kingdoms of Egypt beginning the early dynastic period. What his exact name was, or whether he united the two kingdoms of Egypt peacefully or through conquest is unknown, for different sources tend to say different things about this. And this is where it gets even more confusing still. Ancient Egyptian geography is a bit weirder than modern geography in the sense that Upper Egypt 
is known as the more southern or southerly portion of Egypt, whereas Lower Egypt tends to be the north, around the Nile Delta. Trust me, I found it just as confusing and it has been messing with my head ever since. Despite the early dynastic period having begun around 3150 BC, it has been found that mummification of the dead began circa 3500 BC at Hierakonpolis, which was accompanied by the first evidence of written script through hieroglyphics between 3400 and 3200 BC. So, despite the fact that any form of total unified government didn't appear until a little later down the line, it seems that some of the key aspects that would give Egypt its most recognisable historic features began to develop before any form of mass government. And the evidence we have of regular travel up and down the Nile by boat could suggest that these ideas were spread via the river. And so, even without figureheads and a central government or a central authority, it seems Egypt sort of came together on its own, by way of ideas being shared, perhaps through internal trade, which was said to have flourished along the Nile, with the rich silt carrying minerals and nutrients that would allow for vast excess quantities of crops to be traded back and forth up and down the Nile. And as we'll discover as we go along down the line, throughout all of history, trade not only brings goods, but also also brings with it knowledge, new ideas, religion, new techniques, and sometimes disease. Oh no. Oh, okay. Breathe. It's okay. Smallpox is not a thing anymore. <sighs> okay. All right. Okay. I'm good. So, with the theorized origins out of the way, let's move on from the early dynastic period to the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. Now, this period of time for Ancient Egypt isn't very familiar with most, and in fact, most of the figures and general riffraff of Ancient Egypt that we're all familiar with, in fact, comes from the New Kingdom of Egypt, which occurred much, much later. In fact, roughly 1,000 years after the end of the Old Kingdom, to be exact. But when did the Old Kingdom exist? Well, it is said that the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt began circa 2613 BC and began with the first king. Yes, king. Not pharaoh yet. King. And he was known as King Djosa. This is where we begin to see some of the typical architecture of Ancient Egypt take shape. For example, circa 2600 BC, King Djosa had the first step pyramid built at a region known as Saqqara. Strangely enough, however, the step pyramid dedicated to King Djoser at Saqqara in fact lies far to the south of Cairo in modern day terms, whereas the pyramids of Giza, the ones we're more familiar with, are in fact situated more to the southwest of Cairo, in a completely different area. Why they're not all lumped together, we're not sure. Perhaps because the monarchs after King Djoser wanted to distance themselves from their predecessor, or perhaps out of respect or reverence for the first king, uh, we don't really know at the moment. With the whole business of having a sustainable food supply and having a central government and authority out of the way, excess food stocks and the security of government meant that the Egyptians could instead focus on more technical things. This is where a gent by the name of Imhotep comes in. No, not that one. Yes, it's awesome and interesting and one of my favourite films ever, I am not going to lie, it's just awesome. <coughs> okay, so, back to history. Anyway, Imhotep served as priest to the first king of a united Egypt, King Djoser. Now, bear in mind, when I say priest, I don't just mean a religious figure in the context of Egypt. Because when it comes down to it, priests not only acted as religious figures and emissaries to the gods, but also acted as medical practitioners and to a certain extent, architects and great designers. In this case, Imhotep is widely renowned as one of the most highly regarded medical figures of ancient Egypt's time. For he is known to have written what is believed to be among the first medical texts in history, describing treatments for roughly 200 different diseases, ailments and injuries. Moreover, 
In advancements in the way of medical theory, Imhotep was among the first to have argued that the cause of disease could be natural and not just the will of gods or spirits or the after effect of a curse having been inflicted upon an individual. Because up until this point, it was still believed among virtually all civilizations that disease could be caused by either gods, supernatural entities or spirits. A more Neolithic belief is that disease could be caused when one's spirit or soul was lost or stolen by an enemy. The fact that Imhotep theorised that disease could be of natural causes was a groundbreaking step in the field of medicine, because it signified a move away from the belief in gods, even at this early stage in history. But despite this, secularisation will not be arriving in history for at least two to three business millennia. The Grand Portfolio would like to take the time to apologise on behalf of history for this inconvenience. Now, jokes aside, let's move on to the architecture of the Old Kingdom. It's generally agreed that the Pyramids of Giza, no, not the one at Saqqara, the, um, yeah, yeah, those ones, the more famous ones, so, the Pyramids of Giza were believed to have been built during the Old Kingdom's duration. These larger structures, however, were built after the time of King Djoser. However, the pyramids were built and intended as great, lavish, magnificent tombs for the kings who bear their namesake. For example, the largest of the Great Pyramids was built for the King Khufu between 2589 BC and 2566 BC, and originally these pyramids were built from quarried white limestone. Why they're not white today, you can probably guess. They've been sitting out in the sun for the last four and a half thousand years, so you can probably guess what happened there. And now for the big question, how did these pyramids get built? Well, it's a bit of a bother because seeing as they're standing literally right there in front of us as literally the only remaining structure of the ancient wonders of the world, their construction is one of the greatest historical mysteries in the world. In fact, the theory that we are all taught at school, that the pyramids were built solely through slave labour, has actually been dismissed as mostly untrue. The theory that slaves built the pyramids actually comes from the Greek historian Herodotus, who claims that a workforce of roughly 100,000 people consisting entirely of slave labour built the pyramids. However, Herodotus is known to have his inaccuracies on this because, of course, he lived long after the Old Kingdom had collapsed, long after when the pyramids were said to have been built. So we can't exactly rely on Herodotus for this, but what we do know from archaeology carried out around the site of the Pyramids of Giza is that this massive workforce, not consisting of slaves, but instead of skilled workers, stonemasons, haulers, a bounty of skilled labour. In fact, researchers and archaeologists of the site have recently found the facilities were arranged for up to 4,000 pounds of meat to be produced every single day. Now, in ancient Egyptian society, meat was a luxury food reserved only for the nobility and those with a high skill of labour, which could indicate that the workforce used to construct the pyramids was in fact well fed and looked after. Not far from the sites of the pyramids themselves, a small town appears to have been constructed with neat rows of terraced buildings in order to house the workforce near to the pyramid to make commuting to the workplace easier for those involved. In addition to this, a large cemetery has also been found not far from the pyramids, showing that the bodies of those who died during the construction were neatly placed in individual graves, which could then perhaps mean that this labour force, having been in service to the pharaoh themselves in order to build their tomb, must have been held in higher regard for what they were doing. It's even been found that the workforce was even paid a ration of beer at least three times per day. In fact, it can even be suggested 
that working on the pyramids was a far better place to work than most in ancient Egypt, simply due to the payment and treatment that the workers received as a result of their hard labour. Yet despite all of these archaeological finds, there are still some who believe other theories in how the pyramids were built. Hang on, wait a minute, okay. Uh, look, alright? If you want to talk about conspiracy theories, that's your deal, but... We're doing history here, not conspiracy theories, so... Go on, go over there, off you go. But with the pyramids, it cannot go without saying that this architectural feat is absolutely phenomenal. Given the fact that the Egyptians had to use just bare manpower, no cranes or pulleys were used in the construction of the pyramids, which is absolutely insane, meaning that these huge blocks of limestone were perhaps just pushed into place using ramps, and it would take 3,800 years for another to come along and build something that would finally beat the pyramids in their height. The fact that this early in humanity's history, we have a great architectural wonder such as this is just mind-blowing. Some have even suggested that the pyramids should not even exist due to the technological limitations of the time that would have held them back from building or even attempting something so great as building the pyramids themselves. And yet you only have to go to Egypt to see, there they are. There they stand still to this day, a testament to an era so ancient that Tutankhamun, the pharaoh we all know best, is in fact closer in time to the building of these pyramids than we are to him. With that being said about the pyramids, let's just clear a few things up first before we move on. So we've established that the workforce building and crafting the pyramids was perhaps not made up of slave labour as Herodotus claims. So how exactly does the biblical book of Exodus fit in with this? Well, if we look at the details here, in ancient Egypt, slaves were mostly made up of those who either sold themselves into slavery as a type of bonded labour, or those who were captured during wartime, and even then, these captured people would only perform basic domestic household tasks, such as gardening, cooking, and cleaning. And even if, even if, Egypt had such a quantity of enslaved people as claimed in the Book of Exodus, if they had all migrated and left Egypt all at once, if they had occupied as many skilled roles such as the construction of the pyramids, then it goes without saying that ancient Egypt's economy would have collapsed almost immediately. It is instead theorised, therefore, that the tale of the Book of Exodus in fact could derive from an event in Egyptian history known as the expulsion of the Hyksos peoples, who came to rule Egypt during the Second Intermediary Period, but we'll get onto that at a later date. For now though, with everything, all good things must come to an end. And on how the Old Kingdom collapsed and devolved into the First Intermediary Period of Egypt, the details are sketchy at best, but it's generally theorised that the power of the central government in the then capital of Memphis began to decline roughly around the year 2200 BC, and with that, Egypt splintered into a series of local governorates, with local governors holding control over localised territories, instead of there being one centralised figure of a king. Eventually, these all formed back into Upper and Lower Egypt as two separate kingdoms, with Hierakompolis leading Lower Egypt, and Thebes leading Upper Egypt. But Egypt would live on to be awesome another day. So for now, let's leave it there, and we'll return to Egypt next time, when we discuss in a bit more depth what the first intermediary period was, and what it meant for Egypt, and then the eventual founding of the Middle Kingdom. So, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on the new series of Ancient Egypt. Perhaps consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the video, and maybe leave a comment if I mispronounced something or left something out. Here's hoping I didn't. Anyway, for now, it's time for me to sign off. I am Lewis of The Grand Portfolio, and thank you so much 
for watching.